Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's wonderful to be here and see people logging in. Uh, we're just going to give a few more moments for attendees to log on, and then we're going to get started. Okay, so we're gonna get started now. If there's any questions or concerns, um, you can put them in the chat box and my colleagues and I will help you answer your questions. But we wanna ensure that this webinar is accessible as possible for anyone attending. Um, but hello again, my name is Gerard Arnhem. I'm the Grassroots Advocacy Manager with the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. I'm a white male with short hair and blue eyes wearing a navy blue uh, polo, college shirt um, with white pants. And um, my colleagues and I are very thrilled that everyone is here today to join us. And I hope you all had a very good summer and are staying cool. I know the heat in DC has been a lot, but I believe the last time we spoke was at the beginning of the spring season back in April. So it is great to have everyone back again and to give you an update on what's been happening in Washington, DC and some recent activities the Reef Foundation has been up to. Before we continue, I just wanna thank all of our regional champions who have joined us today and our online advocates and welcome anyone who is new uh, to the Reef Foundation um, or who's involved in other programs at the Reef Foundation. So thank you all again for your support, your attention and just taking time out of your day to be with us. Um, oh, all right. Or do you want to just pause for a moment until I know we have the ASL interpreter is here. Uh, looks like he's on now. And I know there was a question about uh, adding closed captioning. Kelly or Ger Kelly uh, Ham or Gerard. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, so we can do that. Hi, yes, um, for our attendees, there should be a button on the bottom of your screen to press. It says show captions. That will enable captions on the bottom of your screen. Uh, our captioning is available at this time. Thank you. All right, so I believe, yes, the captioning is on. Um, but what I was saying before is I just wanted to welcome all of our regional champions um, and online advocates for change for being with your, uh, with us today. Um, we're going to give you some updates uh, from Washington, D.C., uh, as well as some activities the Reef Foundation has been involved in since we last met back in April. Uh, but here are the layout of today's topics. Uh, we started with the welcome. I will introduce our other speakers for today, and then we'll turn to some election and congressional updates. I'm sure a lot of us have been following the news this past couple of weeks and today um, and today also, but we've had some great successes this year and um, you will get those updates. My colleagues will then speak about some appropriations updates and FA reauthorization, also about the election um, and regarding appropriations updates, which includes PRC funding and key wins in our, key wins in our air travel advocacy. Um, I can then speak to you all about some of our coalition activities and then some updo updates from our grassroots front, um, which is truly a central part of the work we do here at the Reef Foundation. Um, you and your involvement, your investment of time, energy and dedication to our mission is important. And uh, we will have then some time for questions uh, at the end and our, my colleagues then will be monitoring the Q&A box. So please put some questions in if you have them um, and we'll answer them at the end. So 
Uh, before we get started, this is today's panel. Um, so our fellow panelists, uh, John Sawyer and Lisa uh, Lomax, um, we've been working together for a very uh, for a couple of years now since I came to Reeve. Um, and I just want to, before we get to some more updates, I just want to bring on one of our colleagues, Kelly Lamb, who is the senior manager of Team Reeve, and she'll be saying a few words about the passing of our very dear colleague um, at the Reeve Foundation, Coach Mark. Um, so Kelly, thank you for being with us today, and um, I'll throw it over to you. Sure. Kelly, I'm not getting the audio. Yeah, you're on mute. Let's see. You're like a little sparsy, Kelly. Better. Only a little bit. It's very uh, scratchy, Kelly. I'm not yeah. sure. Okay, let me. I'm gonna jump out and then jump right back in. I'm so sorry. I think my connection is poor. Okay, that's fine. Thank you, Kelly. One moment, everyone. Can you guys hear me any better? Much better. Yes, a lot better. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I feel like I've been uh, jumping around rooms all day. I seem to be having internet connections uh, issues. Um, okay, well, thank you again, Gerard, for inviting me on. Um, like I said, my name is Kelly Lamb, um, and I am the senior manager of Team Reeve. I've been in this position for five years. Um, so I coach any of our athletes <clears throat> who participate in our New York City or Chicago marathons. Um, and then we have a whole host of individuals and community members who come to us um, who want to do, doesn't have to be an athletic event, it could be a lemonade stand. Um, we've had children donate their bar mitzvahs, um, do their own DIY fundraiser. So I help those individuals accomplish what they want. Um, but a big part of my role, especially in terms of our marathon athletes and preparing them um, was working with Coach Mark, who I met uh, 10 years ago this summer. Um, I started as a runner and a fundraiser myself after my now husband uh, sustained a spinal cord injury. Um, he's a C4, C5 quadriplegic. Um, and Team Reeve was my introduction to the Reeve Foundation. I was looking for a way to um, do something more tangible for my husband's recovery um, and also feel like I had a sense of community um, that understood what we were going through. And Mark was a really pivotal person, um, not only in my personal life, but also my career. Um, Mark was our amazing team coach for over 17 years for Team Reef. Um, he came on right when the concept of Team Reeve was started by our colleague Bernadette, who's a quadriplegic and hand cycled the New York City Marathon twice. Um, and he grew this program from being five athletes our first year in New York, um, raising very little money um, to raising over a million dollars last year between two marathons and a, a DIY program, which is really remarkable and incredible. Um, and the way Mark was able to accomplish this was because he was so personable um, and so attentive 
to not only our athletes, um, but to their loved ones and um, their connections to our mission. Um, he really didn't miss a beat. Um, he was so concerned with our community and advancing our mission, um, which made it all the more harder when in 2020, um, Mark, who had served this organization and this team for so many years and individuals living with paralysis or another mobility impairment was diagnosed with ALS himself. Um, and, you know, we all thought it a very cruel reality that he had given so much to our community and then um, became a member of our community. Um, as difficult as that was and to watch Mark transition um, and into that part of his life and, and to see his wife become a caregiver. Um, I'm really grateful and proud of the way the foundation stepped in for Mark. Um, I mentioned Bernadette. Bernadette became his caseworker from our information specialist team at the Paralysis Resource Center. Um, she helped him and his wife, Barbara, uh, navigate this new reality. Um, and all of the individual needs that they needed. Um, and obviously when his time came and he passed, um, it's been very difficult for all of our staff and our colleagues, um, but it's been really amazing to see so many individuals on our team this year um, now are going to run and hand cycle the marathon in Mark's honor. Um, and hopefully, you know, continue to, to keep pushing our mission and our fundraising so that um, paralysis from spinal cord injury or, or other degenerative diseases will someday be a thing of the past. Um, but I just wanna say thank you again. And for those that might know Mark or heard his story, um, he's a remarkable human being and um, had an incredible impact on our entire community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for saying those very kind words about Coach Mark. Um, as a Team Reeve alumni, um, I knew Coach Mark a little bit before he um, retired from Team Reeve. Just thank you again for being on and, and saying those kind words. Um, but next up, uh, I just want to talk briefly about um, the Reeve Foundation and celebrating Disability Pride Month. I know we're in the month of August, um, just scheduling. We couldn't we couldn't get the webinar in for July, but um, as you all know, this past July uh, disability was Disability Pride Month and also the 34th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, during last month's observance, the Reeve Foundation was present at a few events, but one of them is the Disability Pride Hip Hop Jam as part of Disability Unite, the Disability Unite Festival in New York City. Um, I uploaded some pictures here on this slide. Um, they're actually very wonderful pictures. Um, they're from uh, our Chief Program Policy Officer, Regina Bly. She was present at that event along with Deg McNeil, who's the Director of the Quality of Life Grants, and Information Specialist, Christina Cali Acevedo. Um, and they're just having a great time at this Disability Pride event during the month of July. Um, and there, as you can see, there was a Reeve table uh, present with education and um, educational and uh, resources from the NPRC. But again, I just wanted to kind of thank Regina for sending me these wonderful pictures. But whether you're living with a disability or an ally or simply looking to learn, there's still a lot more upcoming disability pride activities that's going all the way into the fall. And I will be sure to include a link with um, in our follow-up email um, where you can review these activities across the country celebrating Disability Pride Month. Um, so thank you. But now I'm going to turn it over to Celicia, one of my colleagues. Uh, she's going to give us some updates on the election. Um, so Celicia. Thank you so much, Gerard. Um, and as you mentioned, my name is Celicia Lomax. I am a young Black woman with my hair in a bun, wearing a Black shirt with a floral green and blue design um, and small white pearl earrings. Uh, so that is my audio description there for everyone. And uh, I will be telling you all a bit about the 2024 election and updates related to that. So we can go on to the next slide. So since we all 
last met a couple of months ago, there have been a lot of changes related to this 2024 presidential race, uh, including later breaking news that came out just this morning. Uh, the first, just to take us a couple of months back, is that President Biden has dropped out of the 2024 presidential race. As most people know, this came uh, primarily after his debate with former President Donald Trump and several weeks of criticism and calls from various leaders throughout the nation, including Democratic leaders, uh, really encouraging President Biden to drop out of the presidential race. Uh, as a result, he did indeed do that and endorsed Vice President Kamala Harris to replace him. Uh, in the week since, Vice President Harris has been fully in campaign mode against former President Donald Trump, and there's only less than 100 days left until the elections. It is coming very quickly, and with that, there have been a lot of rapidly changing dynamics that have been ongoing within this presidential race. Uh, part of that has actually been the vice president uh, running mates that each of these candidates are looking at. And so Donald Trump made his announcement a couple of weeks ago in which he chose J.D. Vance, who is a senator from Ohio, to be his running mate. And on the other side, Vice President Kamala Harris has recently chosen, as of this morning, Tim Walz uh, to be her running mate, who is the current governor of Minnesota. Um, and there's going to be, uh, additionally, a rally that's happening today in Philadelphia, which I know a couple of our colleagues within the Reef Foundation are attending. And the changes are ongoing. So there's going to continue to be a lot of talk about the presidential race within our news cycle. And I'm sure people will continue to get updates there. But what does that mean in terms of the work for the Reef Foundation? As far as how it impacts the work, the Reef Foundation will continue to do what it's always been doing. Uh, it's focused on advocacy. It's focused on supporting funding for the Paralysis Resource Center, research on spinal cord injuries, as well as caregiving resources uh, and funding within that space as well. So that work will continue to remain the same within the Reef Foundation uh, and Regardless of, of where people are there, we can go on to the next slide. It is still very much important uh, that people can make sure your voices, your family, your community's voices are all heard within this upcoming election. And so we're really encouraging everyone here uh, to make sure you're registered to vote. We have included this resource, uh, vote.gov, for everyone to go to whenever you have the opportunity. That website includes uh, unique sort of issues and resources around those issues uh, regarding living with a disability, rights and accessibility considerations for everyone, both in terms of registering to vote and as far as voting itself, whether you're voting in person or you decide to vote by mail, there are resources there for you. I will just highlight, it is very important for people to take a moment to check your voter registration deadlines. Those actually vary from state to state. Uh, and sometimes uh, this is not something that everyone is aware of. In some states, you can you can register to vote up until the very day of the election. Uh, but in other states, you have to be registered up to 30 days before the election day. So please make sure you go to vote.gov. You have that opportunity to see that deadline and how it applies to your specific, your specific state and have that opportunity to register so you can make your voices heard. Um, the Reef Foundation definitely wants to continue to encourage people to access the resources that are important to them, especially through the Paralysis Resource Center, as an example, but also make sure your voices are heard as we go into this election cycle. Um, and so with that, I'm going to actually pass over to my colleague, John, uh, to give a few congressional updates. Great. Thank you so much, Celicia. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is John Sawyer. I work with Waxman Strategies uh, along with Celicia. Uh, I'm a white man with uh, blondish hair my mid 40s uh, and a beard, uh, sitting in front of a blurred background and wearing a black polo shirt. Uh, and I'm gonna transition us into a few congressional updates. So what we have uh, first was a slide just saying congressional updates. And now we've got a slide uh, titled government spending and appropriations update with a graphic of uh, an hourglass, which kind of tells you uh, what we're up against here, which is 
uh, of the clock ticking on this year's federal funding debate. So uh, what it's, uh, what we have on the slide and, and what I'll tell you in terms of updates about the appropriations process, uh, which is um, the annual process by which Congress allocates funding for federal programs, uh, including the Paralysis Resource Center, including a number of other uh, priorities that the Reeve Foundation tracks and advocates for. Um, that process is uh, midway and Congress is now back home uh, for all of August. And so one thing to say as an aside, and I know Gerard will come back to this, is uh, it's a good opportunity now that Congress is home to uh, carry out some of your advocacy activities in person if possible. Uh, to set up meetings with your members of Congress, attend events where they are, and talk about some of these issues. Um, but where we are is that Congress spent most of June and July focused on uh, bills to fund the government for the next fiscal year, which is fiscal year 2025. Um, that fiscal year starts October 1st. And uh, what we want to say on the Paralysis Resource Center specifically is Thanks to you and thanks to the advocacy of Reeve advocates and allies, um, we are in a very good place headed into the rest of the process. So uh, both House and Senate uh, committees, the appropriations committees in both House and Senate have released their versions of the bills that will fund the government for next year. Uh, both of those bills fully fund the Paralysis Resource Center for next year at $10.7 million. And so while the process is not complete uh, and probably is a long way from being complete, uh, just having both House and Senate saying that they would like to see full funding for the PRC is a very big win. Um, some folks who've been on these calls in the past year will remember that last year, uh, we had a different start to the process. And last year, the House proposed a nearly 50% cut to the PRC. So we were not only able to fight that off last year and maintain funding, uh, but this year they're not even proposing that cut, which is, a, again, a really, really big win and a testament to the advocacy of this uh, team, uh, of the regional champions, and of Reeve advocates around the country. Uh, so where do we go from here? As we said, we're only partway through the process. Uh, the House and the Senate will both be back home for all of August. Both chambers return to Washington, D.C. In September, on September 9th. Um, and the deadline to pass funding for next year is September 30th. So uh, as has been the case in almost every year of the last couple of decades, we expect that Congress will push that deadline uh, through what's called a continuing resolution, basically where they put government spending on autopilot for a dedicated period of time. And we expect that they will push that deadline uh, from October 1st to after the fall elections. Uh, when they come back after the fall elections, uh, they will then debate whether they want to try and wrap up funding this year or whether they want to uh, kick the can again into next year. So. As we said, we're uh, a little bit of a, a long way from the end of this process, uh, but we couldn't be in a better position going into the rest of the process to advocate for maintaining full funding. That doesn't mean anybody can rest on their laurels. We need uh, continued support. We need you weighing in when there are action alerts, uh, talking about the importance of the PRC in particular to your members of Congress. Uh, but this is a good position to be in, headed into the rest of the year. And we can go to the next slide. So this slide uh, is focused on FAA reauthorization. And just to give a brief description of the, there's a visual uh, that shows a, a jetliner with the logo of the Federal Aviation Administration. And the slide is titled FAA reauthorization. So um, the Earlier this year, uh, after extending for multiple times, uh, Congress reauthorized, which means they passed legislation related to the Federal Administration, uh, Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, and this 
kind of reauthorization has to happen every five years. And it's an opportunity when that happens to change policy, to improve policy. Uh, and in terms of the FAA, that includes everything from, you know, air, airplane design, regulation of airplane safety, uh, how many flights go from different airports, uh, but it also includes what requirements the airlines have to meet around accommodating and serving people uh, with disabilities. And so the Reed Foundation, as part of a broader coalition of groups, uh, really led by Paralyzed Veterans of America, we want to give them big credit for their work on this, uh, successfully advocated for several disability-related provisions that are in that final FAA reauthorization. So those include uh, that the Department of Transportation has to set standards to ensure accessible boarding and deplaning for individuals with disabilities, including wheelchair users. Uh, it means it contains a provision that says that air carriers must inform passengers who request a wheelchair at booking about their rights and about the use of onboard wheelchairs and that those new standards and training, uh, new training standards must be established by next year, by 2025. Uh, that leads me to my last point, which is while these are important steps forward, uh, they will not go into effect right away. When a bill like this passes, then the FAA has to issue uh, its rules to implement the new legislation. Uh, but again, and I, I will also say, you know, I think there's, a lot that wasn't included in this bill that folks advocated for, uh, but these are the kinds of sort of piece by piece incremental steps forward uh, that the foundation has been advocating for, that we've been part of coalitions on, uh, and we're excited to continue working to build on these uh, in work directly with the Department of Transportation and uh, directly uh, with the Congress on these issues. So. With that, I will pass it back to Gerard and let the webinar keep going. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, John. And thank you, Celicia, for those um, updates on Congress and on the election. Uh, but now we're going to get to uh, some updates from our coalition front. Uh, this next slide, just for a brief description, it's a blue background. It has the Reeb logo in the lower left-hand corner, um, and it just says coalition updates. Uh, continuing on, this slide, it's a white background. Uh, the title is coalition updates and it just has a couple of bullet points talking about um, uh, standing system updates and the 1557 final rule but uh just to briefly kind of describe what, what i'm talking about here um this next slide we're, we're going to have some new items such as standing system coverage um and we're still working to push cms to open up the coverage analysis similar to what we advocated for with power seat elevation last year for those of you uh, watching and you've been watching our webinars over the past year. Uh, last year we did uh, push for CMS to uh, cover power power uh, sorry um, power seat elevation. But in one of our recent blog posts, um, it's regarding the 80th anniversary. We took this as an opportunity to remind everyone the benefits of power standing chairs, um, and we will definitely be including this in our. Um, uh, including this link to the blog post in our follow-up email, but uh, we did include, uh, we want to just kind of share, have you share on your social media accounts as we want to continue to spread the word on this important issue. Um, but just thank you again to all the regional champions advocates that took the time out last year to advocate on benefits for power seal elevation. Uh, I believe that and we shall all believe that your voices were heard, and we hope that in the near future, CMS will allow us to comment on the benefits of this crucial, much needed technology for our community. The next bullet point I want to talk about is the 51557 final rule. Uh, this is very exciting news for the paralysis community because this final rule improves access to medical diagnostic equipment so that people with paralysis and other disabilities can have access to things like mammograms, MRIs, and dental chairs, and dental chairs. Um, but we will always continue to advocate for equal access to med uh, medical care. On this next slide we have in the top right hand corner, there is a picture of a woman wearing a black shirt. I don't really know what it says, 
but uh, it's just a picture and she's in a gym-like atmosphere. But this next slide, it's titled New Reeve Endorsed Bills, and it shows some recent legislation making its way through Congress that the Reeve Foundation has endorsed and hope to see passage in the future. First up is the Exercise and Fitness for All Act. It is sponsored by Senator Duckworth and been authorized the U.S. Access Board to issue new guidelines for fitness equipment at gyms and fitness centers. Uh, Senator Duckworth did introduce this bill this past July. It was July 25th. Um, and equal access to fitness is cr critical for maintaining healthy, independent living. Uh, and with this announcement of the bill, uh, Senator Duckworth reminded us, and uh, this is a direct quote from Senator Duckworth, with the Paralympic Games this summer, athletes from all over the globe will once again demonstrate the power of accessible fitness on the world stage. And it is past time America leads by example in making it easier for those with disabilities to access our gyms and maintain a fit, healthy lifestyle. Uh, the next bullet after this, along with Senator Duckworth's legislation, there have been some ABLE bills, uh, that's A-B-L-E, that were sponsored and introduced this past July 31st by Senator Casey. And just as a reminder, ABLE accounts are tax advantage savings accounts for people with disabilities and their families. These accounts allow you to save money without losing eligibility for public programs like Medicaid, SNAP, and SSDI. Um, there is a lot of information presented on this slide. Uh, and for the sake of time, we will be emailing these slides out in our follow-up email so that everyone can review them. So you do not need to take notes. Um, I know that uh, the ABLE Awareness Act, the ABLE Direct Deposit Act, and the ABLE Employment Flexibility Act will all be described in the follow-up email. This next slide, it's on a white background, and in the top right-hand corner, there's the Department of Transportation logo, and it's titled Department of Transportation Proposed Rulemaking. So this is the last slide in our coalition's update, and it's about the Department of Transportation Proposed Rulemaking, and the DOT is proposing to strengthen its rule for safe and accessible air travel via the ACAA. Uh, this rule uh, that required airlines better accommodate passengers with disability by setting new standards for prompt, safe, and dignified assistance, mandating enhanced training for airline employees who physically assist passengers with disability and handle passengers' wheelchairs, outlining actions that airlines must take to protect passengers when a wheelchair is damaged during transport. And our last bullet point, it's described, it says public comments were submitted on June 13th. And just, I wanna take this time to say thank you to all the advocates who submitted comments this past June, uh, before the deadline was up. Um, Again, this is a way to make your voice heard and participate in the federal rulemaking comment, commenting process, but it's another way for you as individuals to have a say in government matters. So it does not just have to be legislative by talking to your member of Congress. Um, it can be also commenting on uh, uh, rules, proposed rules uh, from government agencies. So thank you again for staying involved. Um, Finally, I just want to mention that the Reef Foundation on this rule has submitted comments and signed joint com comment letters with our other coalition partners. And again, we will be keeping everyone updated on the outcome of these comments. So if you have any specific questions, you can feel free to contact me or my colleague, Angel Hines, who's our public policy manager. And um, I will include her contact information in our follow-up email. So thanks again. So this next slide, a little bit uh, description, it's a blue background with the Re Foundation logo in the lower left-hand corner. And the title is Grassroots. And I just wanna say that since we've heard a lot about what's happening on the congressional front, the election um, and our coalition front, uh, we're gonna turn to some grassroots updates and then we can get to some questions. So since our last webinar, we've had some uh, actually, let me describe the slide uh, first. It's a white background. It's titled Dear Colleague Letter, FY 2025 Results, 27 Signatures. Um, and the information on the bullets will, is what I'll be describing right now. But since our last webinar, we've had some good news regarding funding to the Paralysis Resource Center. And uh, as you heard John speak about at the beginning of the webinar, both how the House and the Senate have proposed level funding for the PRC for FY 2025. So this is very exciting news and thank you all again to our regional champions and advocates out there for reaching out to your members and sharing your story and taking action on our action alert. Um, as you may remember, back in April, we put out an action alert which asked House members to sign on to a Dear Colleague letter that was authored by Representatives 
Brian Fitzpatrick from Pennsylvania and Akima Williams from uh, Georgia to support the PRC or Paralysis Resource Center at level funding of $10.7 million for FY 2025. So again, we've had multiple, many, many advocates, many regional champions take action um, to our action alert, and we were able to get 27 House member signatures. So the list of the signatures will be on the next slide, but again, just thank you to everyone who, who took action, who reached out, and also who sent out personalized emails to their members' offices talking about their experience with the PRC, uh, but also you know, advocating to help maintain its funding for the next fiscal year. So this slide, it has a white background and the title is House Members Who Signed On 27 Signatures. And it shows a list of all the members of the House of Representatives that signed on uh, to the Dear Colleague letter, which again was authored by uh, Representatives Brian Fitzpatrick and Nakima Williams. So this is what happens when you make your voice heard and you share your story with your member of Congress and talk about experiences, especially related to the PRC. Uh, we can get members to sign on and show their support. So uh, I also want to thank any regional champion who reached out to me. Um, I know I shared this list in one of my regional champions newsletters, but for reaching out and writing a personalized thank you email to their member's office if their member was on the list, um, thanking them for signing on and supporting the Reef Foundation and the Paralysis Resource Center. So just thank you all again. We could not have done this without you. Um, and we're just so grateful that you are staying involved and staying informed. So thanks again. Now, this slide, I just want to briefly describe it. It's titled Representative Sheila Jackson Lee with parentheses 1950 to 2024, close parentheses. It's on a white background with a picture of her photo. And uh, you may have all noticed on the last slide that one of the signers this past fiscal year was Representative Sheila Jackson Lee. She was a signer of the Dear Colleague letter. And three weeks ago, Representative Jackson Lee uh, passed away from battle with cancer. And I just want to say that we at the Reef, we at the Reef Foundation were very grateful for her support of the PRC over the years. Um, I checked our records. She has been a continuous signer of, a dear, of our, the Dear Colleague letter to support the PRC every fiscal year. And we just want to thank her for her service in Congress and for being a congressional champion for the disability community. So now, just to briefly describe this slide, it's a blue background, and the bottom left-hand corner is the Chris Brandana Reed Foundation's logo, and the title is Recent Activities. And we're just going to talk a little about since we last met in April, some of the activities that we've been doing at the Reed Foundation. So before this slide next is titled Superman, the Christopher Reeve story premiere at the DC Docs Film Festival. It's a white background. And there's two bullet points with three pictures of Alexandra Reeve and two of our advocates, as well as a, a picture of uh, Alexandra Reeve and uh, the panelists at um, one of at the what's it called um, at the end of the film. They did a uh, a conversation that was moderated by a moderator and two of the executive producers, but. I've been talking about this in my newsletters the past couple of months, but there has been a documentary film that was made uh, by uh, for Christopher Reeve titled Superman, the Christopher Reeve story. And on June 13th, 2024, the film premiered at the DC Docs Film Festival at the Smithsonian Museum of American History. Alexandra Reeve Givens welcomed all the viewers with an opening remarks about the film and then sat down with the film's executive producers, uh, Libby Geist and Connor Scheel to speak about the making of the film and what went into making it, the interviews. Um, but the conversation was moderated by CNN's uh, Audie Cornish. And on the slide, you will see that we had some of the local regional champions, which were some of the pictures that I was describing uh, prior. Uh, I snapped a couple pics with them and Alexandra. Uh, the one all the way to the left, uh, her name is Nyla. And the other regional champion all the way to the right, uh, her name is Regan. But um, I'm looking forward to when everyone can view the film. Uh, it will be coming out in theaters in the coming months, but when that happens, I'll make sure to put that information in my regional champions newsletter. Oh, I just realized my camera's been off this whole time. I'm sorry. Um, but anyway, so this next slide I want to talk about has a white background. It's titled Regional Champions Virtual Coffee Session, and there's two uh, 
bullet points that I will describe briefly right now. The following week on June 26th, uh, my colleague Angel and I hosted another regional champions virtual coffee session. And I'm glad that we had regional champions from seven different states and the District of Columbia. Uh, in total, we had 12 regional champions that attended. And uh, I always like to say this, but my goal for these uh, little intimate gatherings is they're all virtual, so anyone can join. I always put the links in my regional champions newsletter. But also we have the regional champions coming together to see what we're all up to in our local communities regarding advocacy. So we were able to welcome some new regional champions, which I was so happy to welcome. Um, and also it allowed us to learn from one another and exchange ideas on ways to advocate locally. So both Angel and I were pleased with the turnout and we hope to get more regional champions to attend the next virtual coffee session. And you guys are probably wondering, how do you attend a virtual coffee session? Well, you have to be a regional champion and we're always looking for more regional champions. So if you're watching right now or watching the recording later on, please reach out to me because we'd love to get you on board and bring you in as part of, as part of the regional champions program. But I will announce a date and time in future regional champions newsletters, but I just want to thank all the regional champions that joined again. And I just took a quick little screenshot. Um, one of the regional champions, I think, was on a cruise uh, touring like Alaska or something, and they dialed in for the coffee session, so that was really nice. Uh, real quick for description of this slide, it's a white background titled Outdoors for Everyone Expansion. And the two bullet points I'll be describing in the, um, uh, in the description. But the, on the lower left-hand corner, there is a picture. There is six pictures, all in collage form, of individuals who are using accessible uh, beach equipment. Uh, some are on boats, some are kayaking. And then on the far right side, lower right side, there's a QR code where you can scan to find the water accessibility checklist. So this summer, the Reef Foundation has launched an expansion of our Outdoors for Everyone initiative with a focus on water accessibility. Our goal with this initiative aims to break down barriers and foster an inclus inclusive environment where all individuals impacted by paralysis can enjoy a wide range of water-based activities. So last, as you may recall, last September, the Outdoors for Everyone campaign was first launched, and that was in 2023, with a focus on making outdoor trails and parks accessible for wheelchair users and others living with disabilities. Um, and we also put out an accessible outdoor checklist. However, this summer we have released a water accessibility checklist, and this is for community and outdoor organizations. Uh, the checklist includes key points tailored to beaches, pools, and other water organizations, ensuring that people living with disabilities can fully enjoy these spaces. Some of the recommendations on our water accessibility checklist cover everything from necessary website and map information for accessibility before arrival to accessible parking spaces and detailed on accessible activities and safe uh, considerations during the visit um, to wherever one will go. Um, we will definitely be sending out, uh, sending out this water accessibility checklist in our follow-up email to the webinar. So if anyone has any questions, you can feel free to respond to that follow-up email or reach out to me directly. Next up, I think we have about two more slides to go before we get to questions, but this uh, slide, it's a white background and the title of it is New Edition of the Paralysis Resource Guide, available now. And in the right-hand side of the slide is a picture of the Paralysis Resource Guide, um, which has Dana Reeve and Christopher Reeve on the front cover. But I did announce this in one of my newsletters a couple of weeks ago, but uh, the CRISPR and Dana Reef Foundation, we released the sixth edition of the Paralysis Resource Guide. It is 392 pages and it's a comprehensive guide uh, designed to support anyone who's impacted by paralysis and has expanded content on topics such as medical care, quality of life, and the latest research of spinal cord injury. Um, it also contains enhanced coverage of children's topics such as nutrition, bullying, and higher education. This new edition is also offered in multiple languages and is available for free download or by mail request. And we will also be including the link of this new edition in our follow-up email. So if you do have the time, please check it out. Uh, it is, like I said, a, a, one of the new editions. And lastly, this slide, it has a white background on the right hand side. It's a picture of the Capitol with the uh, title with the title 2024 uh, Virtual Congressional Advocacy Day, Wednesday, September 25th. 
And I just wanted to highlight this because in this September, in honor of Christopher Reeve's birthday, the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation will be holding our second annual virtual congressional advocacy day, which will take place on Wednesday, September 25th. Uh, the registration link will be sent out later on this week, and I will also include the link in our follow-up email to all the registrants to this webinar. But I do want to invite everyone who is watching the webinar to join us alongside other regional champions and other online advocates for change. Uh, we're going to be discussing the importance of the Paralysis Resource Center, advocating for increased federal funding for SCI research, and share personal stories about the caregiving crisis. Some that are watching now, you may have joined us last year, and that was a, a great virtual congressional advocacy day. We held that in May of last year, but we will have some events leading up to the virtual advocacy day in which registrants will learn about our public policy issues, develop advocacy skills, but also receive an overview on like of the congressional legislative process. So it is definitely an event you do not wanna miss. So please register because space is limited. Um, and if you have any questions, please do not re hesitate to reach out to me. Um, we would love to have everyone join uh, because this is your opportunity to make your voice heard um, in the virtual halls of Congress. So uh, please look out for the registration links. We would love to have um, everyone to come. And that concludes today's webinar. That was a lot, but um, we're happy to take any questions. I haven't been checking the Q&A box, uh, but I will be checking now. So, and we're happy to answer your questions the best we can. If we can't, we will get back to you. But let me see. Um, yes, I will be definitely sharing these slides after the presentation. But if no one else has any other questions, I just, again, want to thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you to John, Slicia, and also Kelly uh, for joining us. And I, I, again, we really appreciate you coming to these webinars and listening to some of our updates from Washington, DC. Like I said, I will be including these slides uh, in our follow-up email, which should come out in the next couple of days with the recording. But again, thank you all uh, for, for being here. Thank you for being regional champions. Thank you for being online advocates. And um, you can always reach out to me with questions. So thanks again, everyone.